Ready? Are you starting now? Yeah, we're doing right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, one coming. Hello and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast, episode 20-7, a video game music podcast. We are your hosts. My name is Rob Nichols. I am bloody exhausted. Pernell is confused, but he is in my room. That is very true. And now he's in your ears. This is also true. You should Uh, clean them. No, no. You need to buffer out the loud yet wonderful sound that is my vocabulary (laughs) flowing from between my teeth. Um, it's, uh, it's been a weird day. I did not remember my wallet for work and I didn't pack a lunch. I saw that, man. <clears throat> no wonder you're like crashed out because you haven't had any food. Yeah. Like, well, last night I didn't stop. We had, I had to record. I didn't finish till 1230. Went to bed at like one thirty or two. Woke up at like seven mm-hmm. and I've been dragging in. But then all I had for breakfast was a single pack of oatmeal, which while they say that's a serving, that is a lie. It, you are, it leaves you wanting more, doesn't it? Oh, it totally does. And, and not that, just another packet of oatmeal. And that is correct. <laughs> then it got worse. So, again, I forgot my wallet at home, so I didn't have any money. And on lunch, my actual lunch break, I snuck out to my car to see if I could find some source of income, something, anything. And I stumbled across a Subway gift card from Kid you Not 2014 that was given to me at my old job. So and it still had credit on it. Hey, that's so a, that's I, a win, man. <laughs> oh, so uh-oh. I got the car, but it was cursed. Rushed, oh, it was cursed. All right, <laughs> and there was no Froger either. I got in the car, drove to the nearest subway, parked my car, only to learn that they recently shut that subway down. They don't exist anymore. So I found this cool gift card. Thought it was a gift from the heavens. I go to the actual store, mm. and it doesn't exist. It was almost like the carrot chase, getting led by a carrot. Wait, the Wawa doesn't exist, or the cart? The, no, it was a like subway cart. Oh, the subway for subway. The, the eat fresh, you know. Um, so I, doubt, I highly doubt, highly doubt how fresh you're eating when you go to subway. Oh, we know, we know, we're getting five dollar foot longs, and that's about all there is I, to I, it. Yeah, I know. I, I had to stop going to subway, but that's for a different podcast. <laughs> the GI cast with Rob Nichols. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> And then, oh my god! Yeah, this has been like it's been such an that that the day in general has just been weird. And then there's the other element of this episode, which is that by the time it comes out, it'll have been the October will be over. Yes. It will be done, mm-hmm. over, gone. Get out of here, October. Get out, October. Push. Exactly. Push. Birthday's gone. Push. No game buying. October gone. Push. Wait, really? How'd you do? Um, I'm, oh, honestly, be honestly, honest, be no, honest no, no, with no, your I'm, listeners. I'm, I'm not lying. <laughs> so it's pretty much exactly as I said I would do it. The game I ended up buying, which was one, mm-hmm. was Ring Fit Adventure because, again, I'm like, it's, it ties into my goals. My exercise. It's exercise. But then here's the thing that was pretty funny about that purchase. Mm. I've gotten so obsessed with going to the gym and then going to burn couch at the arcade that there was no room for Ring Fit Adventure. There's no there's no room in your day. There's no room in the day. Or the week, yeah. So. Yeah, because like if I'm going to exercise, like I'm going to the gym and do. No, that's not. I'm looking at it. and I'm like, oh, that looks like fun. It looks like a cool exercise. But like, like I already like I run a lot. I go to the I wait. I, I go to the gym and lift weights, and then I, I play DDR like for like an hour, two hours at a time, like literally four days a week. Mm-hmm. I don't need the ring fit. <laughs> the thing, I, like, I don't think it's going to be enough. Is what I'm saying. Like I have this yeah. feeling it may come in handy come with, as winter builds mm-hmm. up though because I was already talking to the gym guy. I was like, I don't know how energized I'm going to be to drag myself out in the snow or on a really really cold day to go exercise. You know, that's a good point. Like, especially like going to the arcade to play. Uh, did you did I knock your headphones out? Yep. <laughs> how, how are you doing now? Yes, I, yeah, it sounds good now. Yes, I forgot to put my headphones on. There we go. Um, how, can you still hear me, Pernell? <laughs> my hearing <laughs> is gone! Oh my god! <laughs> like right next to each other. Um, yeah, no, so when I went to play at the arcades a lot, the wintertime was always hard because I would still want to wear shorts. Yeah, that's where I'm at. you got to park close to, the, to wherever the arcade is mm-hmm. and then like trudge. No, trudge through the snow. The, the worst was when I used to play at, um, there was a bowling alley in Philly, mm-hmm. in, in University City. And they had an ITG machine there. It was amazing. But the problem was was that you couldn't park next to the place. Mm-hmm. So I had to park on the street like four blocks away and then walk through the snow in my shorts. 
Oh, geez. In that four would, blocks. That to, would kill to me. Place. I, you know, you, you bring a pair, you bring a change of shoes and a towel and a hoodie and you I, run like heck. I can't bring a change of flesh. <laughs> I'm just kind of screwed. I'm well, cold. You got a big coat. Yeah, but I'm wearing shorts. But the coat covers your, your legs. My coat has never covered my <laughs> legs and you know it. Also, one thing worth mentioning too, because I totally I wanted to mention. It's a weird observation. All right. So, again, I the whole month I was like, don't buy any games. Now, keep in mind, I still got review codes, but as we've already established in the past, it's not about the games; it's about the acquisition of the games that really does the woo. But by not keeping up with my usual flow of purchases, a weird thing came to mind. Though I kind of guess I already realized it was another thing to see it firsthand, which is that. The game cycle, the game release cycle, mm-hmm. never really stops. No. Ever. No. And what that means is that unless you intend to straight up buy and play a thing, a lot of the times it gets lost in the ether. Like, the hence, one game I intend to... the backlog. Yeah, right? yeah. It's creepy. Like, one game I know I want to get from this last month is Indivisible. Mm-hmm. And that's because I've been following it since it kicks this it kicks early twenty fourteen. So oh, wow. it was like it just happened to come out last month. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, I already don't remember half the games I wanted in October. And I already know that for November, aside from Indivisible, the only game I really see myself saying I have to get, well, because I really do, because that's how I'm getting into MAGFest this year, is uh, Pokemon Sword. Now you're getting into MAGFest because of our podcast. Oh, I hope so. That would be nice. But I'm already committed, so I'd be doing both. <laughs> oh, okay. I, already, I, mm-hmm. I, had, I had to tell them in advance, like, okay, oh, I can do so this. you are committed? Yeah, so oh. I'm doing both. But I'm actually going to be a little bit more, try to be a little bit more rigid. So if people are doing something like, look, I'm not doing my battles right now. I want to go hang out with people and then come back yeah. and do battles or something. Yeah, because I went to hang out with you for the day. And you were like, I got to play Pokemon with these guys. I'm like, well, that's cool. Well, if I know in advance when you're going to be there, I, I'm staying on the can- on the ground. So I can actually probably do an yeah. earlier shift. I did then- like last minute just drive down and like hang out. <laughs> yeah, if I know when people will be around, maybe I can be like, okay, on that day, mm-hmm. I'm going to do my shift in the morning yeah. so that then when the afternoon comes, I'm free. Well, this is going to be a big weekend because we're going to have uh, Cameron Worma, Cameron Childs from the Mad Gear. Cameron Cameron. And Ed Wilson Cameron. <laughs> Ed Cameron Wilson. <laughs> Ed C. Wilson. Um, they're all coming down, which is going to be awesome. Or I guess Cameron's coming up because he's from somewhere else. So, But no, I'm, I'm really excited to, to see them. I'm, I've been in contact with Cameron Childs a lot over the past month. Because yeah, you're working on the, on some mystery products. Yeah. Um, you guys I, are collaborating on mystery goods. Yeah, I can show you some of that before before uh, long. But we should tell uh, our listeners that this is a live streamed episode. So we're going to leave in most of like any any um, technical issues. <laughs> like the... Oh, Jesus. Oh, that was a technical issue. That, oh, was, that was not... That was wacky, Pernell. No, it wasn't. Um, that was totally <laughs> intentional. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so and if you would like to uh, watch us record at a podcast or be dopey. in my office, yeah, and be dopey and hang out with us and crack jokes, uh, go to patreon.com slash rhythm and pixels and you can go there and do things and we appreciate it or not. Just listen to the show. We're going to keep producing the show because it's what we love to do. Yeah, it's a fun time. My first track for now. This is no. Oh, one last thing. 20 we got, seven. This is you. You no, start the show. Also, we have to state this beforehand. So okay. this episode was a Patreon it, well, it is a Patreon episode, but we went with the attempt of pick to crack of themes. Um, so we didn't get as many as we wanted for the theme. I think people just wanted to start sending tracks in. So I think what's going to happen going forward to be on the safe side. I think I'm. A, I think I still. We still should do themes. Mm-hmm. And if people want to submit themes, they can because honestly, I enjoyed seeing what people came up with. Yeah. But in addition to that, if you're just like, I can't come up with anything for this theme, but I want to drop a track in general, you're welcome to do that too. But I'm going to admit, themes will take precedence, because right. that just makes sense. Right. But I, I just picked some tracks for the show also, in case we wanted to just add some more. And they some fit, sweet fleet. They fit the October theme. I'm not... Okay, so th- this, uh, we're recording this the day before Halloween, and uh, I would say that generally um, podcasts of the video game music nature like to do spooky tunes and spooky tracks and guess what for now i'm not a fan i don't like to be scared why it's like uh i just don't like it for now <laughs> i had a, a friend of mine posted a video not too long ago about you know like just a bunch of snapshots of people being creeped out in a haunted house like you know here's a shot ah, I'm and the friend's mom was like why do people 
<laughs> enjoy being scared all the time. I don't and I so. said, I, I'm just going to speculate here. It's an, it's a safe adrenaline rush. So if you're in you an go. environment yeah. where you know you're not going to get hurt, but your body's going to have that natural reaction to shock, the way the body works is when you get shocked, it does send a surge of adrenaline through you because it triggers the fight or flight mechanism. Mm. So mm, mm. knowing that that's going to have you, oh my God, and you're like, ooh, that feels good. I know I'm not in danger. So it's like but a, it feels it's a, like I'm in danger. Like a thrill, right? Yes, it's that, a thrill. That, that's why you that's why you take uh, the someone special to the to a scary movie and so they freak out and they get all scared, but then it's like, woo. And they yeah, get, but and that's a different kind of thrill, thrill, Robert. That's why that's, <laughs> that's, 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 anyway, I don't I don't like scary movies. <laughs> um, anyway. No, no I, I do like like supernatural stuff that men thrillers that make you think. Um, so I'll, I'll give them that. But like uh, it took me forever to see get out. Because I knew it was going to be creepy and scary, but like I eventually loved it and saw it because you it better was, believe it was you more loved it. of a th- supernatural thriller. Mm-hmm. For people who have not seen the movie, I will not spoil anything. And then, um, um, uh, 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 key, not key. It was a Jordan Peele's next movie, um, which I still need to us, see. I still need to see too. Just the trailer, just the trailer for the movie Us, which came out <laughs> ages ago. Just the trailer gives me a panic attack. It oh my is god! Terrifying. It is so scary. Like the whole like doppelganger, um, like evil version of yourself. That whole thing. And that I'm, premise sounds amazing. It's to just me. it's just terrifying. It just creeps me out. I'm in the mood now. Let's listen to some music for now. So we should just call today's episode of Danger and Docile. <laughs> we have <laughs> Danger and Docile. I was trying to think of a good word. That's uh, the best I had. We'll come up. We'll come up with a name by the end of the show. I'm sure. So right. this first track was submitted by listener John Jekyll, mm-hmm. Mixix Master himself. Oh, the Mixix Master. That's right. I like it, yeah. And this is from a franchise that I actually hold near and dear to my heart as well, that being Resident Evil. And this track is from the first game, titled First Floor Mansion, composed by Makoto Tomozawa, Koichi Hiroki, and Masami Ueda. Welcome back <laughs> to Danger and Docile. <laughs> You're listening to First Floor Mansion from the game Resident Evil for the Sony PlayStation and a, re- a variety of other uh, consoles. Yeah, a variety of consoles. I've never played the first Resident Evil. Um, oh, we'll get back to that. I, like run, my, I gotta remember through the rest of this, but yeah, you're going to have to talk about that. Oh, well, we, do we have a, uh, a testimonial? Oh, indeed, D. Excellent. So, Monsoir Jekyll did say, I'm replaying it now, Resident Evil 1, and it's my favorite game series ever. Honestly, I can relate to that. The I love the original three the most for PlayStation, and something about the first one is just so nostalgic and classic, I could play through it a million times, it would never get old. And I would have to say, of course, it's very nostalgic and awesome. Like, think about it. Resident Evil 1, pretty much, even though there are games that fit the horror mold prior to that, like the old original Alone in the Darks and such, yeah. Resident Evil was the first one to be what we've come to know as survival horror games. You had the dog window stuff. You had the first encounter with spiders. You had the hunter first time lobbing your head off. You had so many things. The crows, the gut. There was a lot of stuff in this game that I remember part and parcel mm-hmm. just by virtue of the fact that this was all my first my first exposure to the genre. I had a lot of like those like cinematic like camera angles too, right? 
Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny <laughs> because I wonder, like, of course they had to do, they had to do it because I think it was because the technology is why they did it that way. But I wonder if those angles were heavily I'm not saying almost positive they were heavily influenced by the desire to get set up the right scares and scenarios. Yeah, I remember reading a lot about Resident Evil Two, which was my first Resident Evil game. Okay. And <laughs> it was my first Pernell. And um and it was all about like creating like like in a horror movie where you can't see behind like the main character and then something jumps out. Like they were trying to control how things were. Oh, uh, you know what? I'm thinking of Silent Hill. Scratch all that. No, no. Resident Evil would have been it. Silent Hill. There weren't. There were very no. few set camera set scenarios in that because like if you were in the city. But there, for example, there you, were sections. I think it was Silent Hill too, where like you would walk and like the camera would slowly like tilt. Yeah, in the back yeah. alley, I know for sure yep. did that. Things things like that would happen. Oh. Um, but no, I'm pretty sure they did that too for Resident Evil or. Biohazard. Yeah, Resident Evil Biohazard. was all about that. Like, it was always, you turn the corners, I got, damn, yeah. waiting for you. Like, what is he doing there? Why is he there? I know I've talked about this before, but um, me and my friend Bill, Bill Gates from uh, high school, yeah, Bill Gates, uh, we um, we rented this and Parappa the Rappa at the same time. That's a good combo. <laughs> a very weird combo. We put oh, this, that is true. I never played Resident Evil, so I didn't know what to expect. So we put this in. And like we go through the whole um, intro sequence, and it's like, oh, this is great! I can't wait to get started. But when the city's all fired up, yeah, and then you start, you, you run out past the bus, and like there's zombies chasing you. Mm-hmm. And so in our mind, you shoot the zombies, you shoot them all dead, and continue on to the next screen. But oh, you, you had no bullets, <laughs> but you have like no ammo. Yeah, you're supposed to run through that. Scene. And we got killed on this first screen over and over and over again until someone was finally like, hey, what if we just keep running? <laughs> We could just like get it out of the way, and then and then we realize like oh that's what the tension is is that you don't have this isn't like Contra we're not playing Contra nope <laughs> you're not playing that kind of game though I will say that when it comes to these kinds of yeah. games it's an interesting dynamic that they set up for you so when you first come in at least in the earlier Resident Evil games when you first come in it's all about being methodical making sure you don't get hurt by surprise mm-hmm. enemies. Conserving ammo, right? You know, finding the solving the puzzles, dodging the crap. But then you want to unlock the rocket launcher, so now you got to beat the game in like two hours. Uh. So now all of a sudden, this game that originally revolved around tension mm-hmm. and being careful, now you're just being reckless, but planning planned recklessness. You're like, okay, I go down this hallway, I can circle around this zombie, jump over the dog, and you're just like, now you're some kind of superstar athlete playing an action game, which was once yeah. a survival horror game. And all of a sudden, all of that tension you had at the beginning, it's all gone. It's all gone. It's all, it's all gone. It's all memory of what you're doing and focus on just trying to get through the stage. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's awesome. All right, so my first track, Pernell, is a game that I just started playing. This is from Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Ooh. And this, one, this track I picked is composed by Ryosuke Fujioka, and the track is called Gears of Fortune. Gears? The Gears of Fortune.
listening to Gears of Fortune from the game Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, composed by Ryosuke Fujioka. And I, I picked this track because I, I love the, the the heavy guitar, the double kick double kick bass, mm-hmm. and the um, the violins at the same time. It reminds me of Falcom Sound Team. Okay, like, this is like this sounds like it's from Trails of Cold Steel or something. I guess I can kind of mm. see that at least maybe one. Yeah, I can see this fitting into that game with certain elements. Yeah, it's not as like fast. It, it, the only thing, the only thing is lacking is like more heavy guitar. It's but um. Okay, so I'm looking at I'm looking at Purnell's Bloodstained, uh, <laughs> um, game. Just uh, picked up my file. Just mining. Yeah. Something well, better. okay. So you can you can get items and armor, and you can change your character, and then it changes the actual character, right? Yeah. Though later so on, mine so is gonna, nothing like this. <laughs> so I'm also going to wager you didn't get to the barber yet, did you? No, I haven't. I've only about. Oh, cool. You can change your hair and everything um i don't think so much to change the hair though you might be able to and i'm just not remembering it but you can definitely like change the hair color mm-hmm. your outfit style and all that stuff oh, cool. so it basically becomes like fashion souls mm-hmm. in the sense of you just know what? Well, dress I'm, up your dude however you want what which I'm is actually really right cool now, everything i'm wearing right now is just whatever gives me the best stat boots oh i i stopped doing that stat, real quick stat boots I stat, stat boosts now, um, all the weapons are different. I've only played a couple hours. Like all the weapons are like are play really differently. Now, is it just like a style preference as you play along, or is it like different it, weapons for different scenarios? It's totally style preference. Like, so, so what, are you, what are you playing with right now? Like, what's your what's your? Um, like, I what, prim- what do you have equipped. Well, I don't know, but let's see. I primarily focus on the boots, so I have like lethal boots, and I found these dumb so, toy shoes that squeak whenever you walk. So, so they the, have terrible the, power, so but the I like kicking, the squeaky shoes. Yeah, all the kicking and stuff. Yeah, kicking, uh, squeaky shoes. Um, I use. I started using the whips, but they have a stupid slow charge to yes. them. So even though I like the whips, I never feel as though I want to stick with them. Mm. But it's mainly the shoes and this one ability you get that kind of sounds like a chainsaw sword out of a portal. And that's kind of become the, my go-to. Because even though there's like a ton of abilities in this game, mm. you don't... like. They designed this with the intent being oh. just to customize your own play style. It but the downside of that is that you can yeah. kind of find five abilities early on. And never change them because they never stop being good. Right. So, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is um, Igarashi, Igarashi's like kickstarted game, his like love letter to, or his like his new Neo Symphony of the Night, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. It's Castlevania Symphony of the Night and everything but the, except for is. the property licensing. It is, it is so close. This game is so close to the original Symphony of the Night. That I was terrible at the original game. Yeah. I am horrible at this one. I am so bad. Um, and the one thing I noticed, I'm, I don't know if it's just my version, but I'm playing it on the PlayStation 4. The load times are so bad. No, that's every system. In fact, I was oh, hoping you'd tell me that the load times were better on there. because no, like it's. Now I'm not playing it off a disc. I've downloaded it, and it's just. I'm it, playing off the oh, cart. It's terrible. Oh, so you're playing on. I'm on, playing on a cart. Load times are bad here too. I, I think it's just oh. poor optimization on yeah. their part. Like, like, there's no reason that after you die, it needs to load the main screen again and then load a loading screen and then load the game again. There's no reason to, to do all of that back and forth. But they want you to really, they want you to stress not dying. They want, well, you, they want you to work that much harder to okay. not watch load screens. That very first boss, the giant naked tentacle woman on the boat. Uh huh. Um, spoilers, giant naked tentacle woman on a boat. Slow down. I died like too. six or seven times. Like, no joke. It was so bad. It they was, probably they probably passed. Oh, she was hard, difficult though. Oh, was she difficult? I played, yeah, for I played, me, it was. Cause I was playing on the harder. Uh, yeah, I, obviously, <laughs> I played it on normal. Um, it's just I, I couldn't figure it out. And then um, the next guy, he was like a, he was the the warrior from the east. He was easier for me though. He I got took used me to a it bunch, and it was it would kill me was I didn't realize there was a save point nearby, so I had to keep going back and forth. <laughs> that can't be good. And in my mind, I'm like, maybe I should level up first. But I had the same problems with the original Symphony of the Night, where I'm like, I would get lost and then I would die. <laughs> yeah, that's what Chris just said. The reloading post death is really long. I was like, yeah, that's the punishment. Yeah, that's that's a punishment. See, I, like, I don't want to be punished. Oh, you? Oh, yeah. Why? No, I'm not playing a game to be punished. Like, oh no, you're not. I, I can play a hard game and it could be hard. I don't need to be punished for losing. But that's the gimmick. It's not the gimmick, not but the that's, gimmick. How I, that's how I justify <laughs> that's it. That's how you're justifying it. It's like, we have really I'm, crappy optimization. Well, that's that's the punishment that's for Pernel, dying. It's Pernell playing these games. I've been naughty. Punish me. <laughs> that's not what I Punish do. me, senpai. No, I don't want to die. That's the point. <laughs> that's the goal. But right, um, right. We, should, we should move away from that topic and move on to your next track, then. All right. Oh, by the way, we should just say that this track is epic. No, I'd never use Epic. You know it. It is no. 
it is dopeness. It is epic. <laughs> uh, when I... uh, anyway, go on. So I'm going to pick this track because it's it's from a game I've never played, but, well, I need to because it's sitting on my computer thanks to a very friendly podcast listener. Um, I'm going to pick this track submitted by a listener of the dude from the game Undertale called Your Best Nightmare. And it's composed by, as everyone knows, Toby Fox. And it's, it's a banger, actually. That's good. I do like how that ends. It's just like statics. <laughs> yeah. So you just listened to Your Best Nightmare from the game Undertale, composed by Toby Fox and submitted by patron listener The Dude. So this track, well, I'll just actually go into the actual testimonial mm-hmm. in a second and let you know what he had to say about it, and then I'll throw my own 15, 20 cents into it. Um, because honestly, quite frankly, this game 
next game is where it's at. But he goes, ah, that laugh. The laugh. You know, I, I, I remember. Didn't, I didn't listen to the rest of the track. Wait, 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 wait. That laugh is crazy. But that's from him. Oh. <laughs> he goes, God, that laugh. <laughs> I remember the feeling Undertale gave me to this day. That feeling of how I could do anything and how I just had to stay determined and I could overcome any obstacle the game threw at me. And then this song comes in and it ripped all that feeling away. It left me feeling hopeless and as meta as the game is, it knew that I had taken that it knew that I had taken that hope away and doubles down by throwing that laugh at you. The tension rises and it's no longer about staying determined and overcoming obstacles, but now it's about simply surviving and keeping your head above water. It messed with me so friggin' hard, man. It's the perfect spooky tune for that reason, and that in a nutshell is why Undertale is one of my favorite games ever made. So, honestly, between this track and my having not a ton of familiarity with Undertale, mm -hmm. I ended up spoiling what this track is from and how it plays. Oh, so you could see, you, so you watch the whole thing with it? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Now, and while I won't spoil how it comes into the game just in case someone wants to do it themselves, I will say that it comes into a, a be a scenario that is extremely unexpected by the player unless you also spoiled yourself. <laughs> and as the dude mentions, it's a scenario where you are pretty much struggling to survive because you're not meant to win by virtue of how the game lays out. Like you're not obviously you're not it's not a throwaway battle, mind you, but you can't do anything but try to live. Oh wow. And as the game as the battle plays out, it's stunned and like choreographed phases I'll say meaning that the reason that the song changes tempo and styles in the song is because the, the scenario changes mm. and during these scenarios quote unquote help comes into play to try to give you temporary reprieve and you have to reach out for the help and oh. when it comes to you that's like a, again like a temporary so like, reprieve like in this section yeah like think about like Earthbound how like you fought Gygus and it was like you had to pray to pray for help mm. a similar concept where it's like okay I gotta pray for help and then help sort of comes in a weird way <laughs> and honestly it's just it's a wonderful wonderful scenario hmm. that I honestly want to experience myself whether I'll do well at it I don't know because it looked like it was really hard to do yeah but the the I know the combat system is really like it's just like dodge them up um, yeah like there's actions uh, but whenever the yeah. enemy attacks is done in a way that's more like a little screen like a little rectangle or yeah. square yeah and you're a little heart and you gotta you gotta like dodge attacks and stuff like like in a shoot em up game Exactly, yeah. but this battle mm -hmm. changes that a bit too. It's really weird. Like, oh, cool. Nick Walk that Nick Walker flat out says this whole scenario is a total left turn for the game, and it's great. And like I said, based on what I saw and what I know about Undertale, I agree a hundred percent. It, I did not expect that to be in the game, period. And it makes me want to try it. Yeah, it's a, it's really cool. I like this track a lot. I, every time I hear more music from this game, because I never, I haven't sat down and listened to the full soundtrack yet, like on its own. It, but every time I hear new songs from it, I'm like, yeah, this is great. This is so good. Yeah. It's like, just really well done. And I love that. Like, I mean, I don't love that, but I'm amazed that it's done by one person. But Toby Fox very, is on fire. Like, very, very, very talented. I want more of his stuff. Like, all I know about that he's done is Undertale, mm -hmm. and he did one track for Y2K. That's right. And that track yeah. in Y2K is really good, too. <laughs> so... If anybody knows other stuff that Toby Fox has done that just happens to have slipped my mind, yeah, or just let us snuck know. Past us. Yeah, all right, we need to hear it. So I'm going to move on to my second track. This is from the game. This is a very appropriate game for the Sega Genesis, the spooky Sega Genesis, the Splu <laughs> the Splega Blenesis, the Blega Blenesis. This is Splatterhouse Three, the third, the third, the third. Um, this is Stage Three from Splatterhouse Three. For the Sega Genesis, composed by Eiko Kaneda.
This is Stage 3 from Splatterhouse 3 for the Sega Genesis, composed by Eiko Kaneda. And um, yeah, Splatterhouse 3 is a, or the Splatterhouse series is just a fun, like, splat em up. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. It's like they, uh, they wanted to make like a fun adventure thing where you're still like trying to save the girl and do all like the normal, you know, 90s video games, 90s video game stuff, except that they wanted to make it scary, so they gave him the Jason mask. <laughs> The odd thing about it is that, that makes him go crazy. <laughs> like back, gives him power or something. Hey, but like it's funny because like back then, Splatterhouse was made to be like mm-hmm. well, at least as far as like promotions go and the like and media hype, mm-hmm. they made it seem much scarier and more grotesque than it actually is. Yeah. Like I honestly stayed away from it for the most part because of it. Oh, it because skeeved of me out. The hype they gave it. it was like, oh, it's gonna be gross. I mean the name is Splatterhouse. Like Yeah. yeah. It threw me off. And I love this. Here's nonsense. So I have my switch here. And last weekend is going to try to Joy-Con shame me. Pernell has the gray Joy-Con. So sad. First of all, I have more than this. However, I like the gray. That's what came with my system. Also, I did want the neons, this but I the, couldn't get them because... This is the travel switch. I'm sorry. The, the nice the nice Joy-Cons are at home. They're at home. In their case. Along with my the two pros, my pro <laughs> controllers the same way. Like I, never, I only use those when people come over. Pernell knows if he brings his switch here, it might get spilled on. Or a dog might bite it. <laughs> a dog might bite it. <laughs> but like, honestly, I wanted the neon system. Just they were sold out back when the oh, Switch came out. And now I have other Joey-Cons, but I never have to take them off and switch them. I just use the ones that all came right. with the system. All, of all the game systems that you've owned, what, what's, what do you think is your favorite controller? First Con- party, third party, doesn't matter. Like, What was your, what do you think has been the, your favorite controller that you've used? Hard to say. Like, a part of me wants to say the DualShock 4. No, really? the, all of them. Yeah, but mm. admittedly, the DualShock Four recently. I feel like I, I recently started experiencing a slight bit of drift in the left thumbstick, mm. which is kind of taking me down a peg on enjoying that controller. But the DualShock Four is probably my favorite, seconded by honestly the Sega Saturn 3D pad. Okay, yeah, with the, the, the analog stick, the first analog stick, right? Yeah, like, yeah. even though I wasn't a huge fan of the analog itself, it was the actual grip of it and yeah. using it that felt wonderful. Yeah, because we, and have, we have larger it. hands, like like longer fingers. Uh-huh. So it's good to have, like, a, a wider thing. And then lastly, though, this is going to be taboo as all get out, <laughs> probably the N64 controller. Huh. So the thing is... You know, I, it, I liked it. I liked it specifically for like GoldenEye and those types of games because you could hold you can hold it like a trigger like a, like a gun and use your thumb uh-huh. on the stick to look around so it, it felt very natural in my hand and that's how it was like yeah. admittedly I'll admit that if you look at the N64 controller at face value based on how we use controllers now it looks stupid you're like <laughs> okay thumbstick is here how am I supposed to use the cross pad and the idea was that back then they didn't intend for you to the thought was a game might have 3D motion. If it has 3D motion, you'll use the thumbstick. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, you'll use the cross pad. Right. And for the most part, the only downside to that controller, in my opinion, is that it just didn't fully utilize every button in every game. Mm-hmm. But when I would play games like Mario 64, or even like as corny as it may sound, like even like Torok, which was notorious for being frustrating with some of the controls. But even something like Torok or something... The controls worked very well for me playing that. Yeah, the 3D games, right? Yeah, the yeah, 3D absolutely. games, that controller was fantastic. Mm-hmm. I loved using it. And interesting, Nick Walker goes, that Nick Walker goes, the GameCube. And I will agree with that, too. Yeah. But. It felt nice. But I if I the first time I saw it, I thought it was the weirdest thing. I was like, what are, what is happening? Like, well, they, it looked like someone just, like, took buttons and, like, threw it at the wall. Like, here's a controller! And that's, to me, that's the beauty of the GameCube yeah. controller. Because <laughs> it, it was just crazy. <laughs> it looked, it, the GameCube and this controller looked like something straight out of a toy chest. Okay. Which yeah. is, a, but that's the thing. Some people would, people would mock that. I'm not that guy. Mm-hmm. I like that look. Mm-hmm. And I like the fact that when you hold the GameCube controller, it has a natural feel to it. And even though the buttons are all bizarre looking in that sense, they're that way for a reason, because they designed it to be like, okay, well, this button is the one you'll use the most often, mm-hmm. thereby is the largest and the one in the center. Then there's supporting buttons that go around it. B was the least used button, thereby it was smallest and in the lower left corner. The thumbstick had a nice click motion to it, or so you had an analog thumbstick on the right, nice C-stick clickiness. I love that. Mm-hmm. And the analog buttons were really good. Also, the trigger buttons were really good too. They had a nice click on them as well. Yeah, I was. I, I loved the the triggers on the Dreamcast. That was the first time I saw like the analog triggers that had like a, you could push it in further. But the problem was was that there was no 
there was no um, uh, trigger buttons as well. So like if you had a game that you had to use the trigger, you never knew how hard you had to push it Hang in. On. Hang on, I'm, I'm confused by this. Mike mentions and I'm thinking about it because I don't remember it, but about to find out. Mm-hmm. He likes the Vita's D-pad. Oh, so you have a PS Vita. Yeah. PlayStation so. Vita. There's the D-pad in front of me. I will say, look at the D-pad is pretty nice on so the Vita. So we are on stream. I have I have a I PlayStation still, Vita in my hand. It looks looks battle battle worn. Well, oh hush up! I took good care of that. System. That's really good. Yeah. And I, also, there's a screen cover on it, which is why the screen might look weird. To oh you. yeah, yeah. No, that's good though. Um, that's interesting. Okay, so my favorite controller was the uh, the Gen- Sega Genesis six button controller. That is a good controller. The D-pad, it was like the original Genesis controller where the D-pad was like a big circle mm-hmm. that can kind of move around, but it was really like, it was, uh, sorry, here you go. That's okay. <laughs> it I'm getting, was, I was like, don't break it! <laughs> no, no, it, was, it was really tight on the um, on the pad, and it was made out of some kind of material that was like kind of rubberized that it felt really light. And the only other time I felt a controller that had a material like that on the, on the directional pad was on the, it was a Sega Genesis... Um, fight pad. It was like it was from Capcom SNK. Fight pad. I forget who released it. I think it was Hori. I do have to ask this. Here's the follow up, though. Okay. The real deal, because this is. I think this is the harder question. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, your least learn, favorite controller. We're learn something about each other here. Well, not. Uh, well, my maybe least, my least favorite controller. Okay. Well, I gotta start. It's harder, isn't it? Mm, which is the ones I never want to go back to. Okay. I'm going to start with my favorite system, the Sega Dreamcast. You didn't like the controller, though? No, because the way your fingers kind of fit underneath, they would tuck underneath the other uh, grips. Yes. And they would hurt. Okay, and then the uh, the NES, the original NES. Okay. That was not designed for hands. That was designed for robots. Smart man. <laughs> Smart man. And then also, um, I'm going to say the Xbox 360, but... On, but not in general, my Xbox 360, because I could never get the batteries to stay in. The batteries always fell out. Ah, oh, so they basically just the build of that particular controller I, was a jerk Yeah, face. I would be playing, and then the battery would just fall out every time. Every time. I had to leave it plugged in. I hated I'm, it. I'm going to hit you with two these hitters, two heavy hitters. What's up? So the obvious first one <laughs> is going to be the NES controller, and that's simply because I had big hands, and that thing was, even when I was a kid, that thing was never comfortable right? to hold. yeah. But it worked, so I used it, but I didn't like it. Um, I guess honorable mention would be like the Sega Master System controller because they were oh. dang near similar. Oh, um, I know what you're gonna say, but no. Oh, you want to take a guess? What is my by far least favorite controller? Turbo Graphics 16. No, nope. that, that button was painful. painful. I but it had, but it, thankfully it had the turbo function, so it kind of uh, mitigated okay, a lot so, of that. Okay, so what pain. is it? What is it? Jaguar. Oh, the Jaguar. The Jaguar. <laughs> it was it was such a weird concept <laughs> yeah. for a controller. It was like a telephone. Plus game controller in yep. one. I don't understand it. It, it made no sense. Oh. It, yeah, that was weird. Any, is, uh, this, uh, real quick, do you have any highlights in the chat about what their favorite controllers might be? So Chris Murray and Mike Myers have kind of commiserated on the 8-bit do being awesome mm-hmm. for like controller usage. Okay. Surprisingly, Mixix Master likes the DualShock 3. So I shouldn't say that so harshly because... How is that different from the DualShock 4? And I'm, I was going to get into it. I, like, I shouldn't say it so I, harshly. I skipped that generation. Well, that's what I was getting yeah. into. Like, I shouldn't say it so harshly because theoretically, the DualShock 3, there's nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you like other DualShocks, like your question might be, like you just said, why would you hit the DualShock 3 if you like the 4? And the answer is, it was smaller and it was lighter. I like... Controllers with weight to them, yeah, and I like controllers that are large enough for my hands. And I would get finger cramps mm-hmm. using the DualShock Three over time, and it was too light for me. Yeah, okay. The DualShock Four remedied both of those problems. Yeah, for yeah, me. yeah, totally. Um, let me see. Least favorite from Mike Myers. This is an interesting one. The Atari Fifty Two Hundred. Yes, I barely remember what that thing looked like, unless I, I was just the joystick with the button in the corner. I've talked about it on a past episode and how easily those things broke. Not a great controller design. Not at all. So. But is that what I'm thinking about? The joy, the Thor joystick with the button in the bottom left corner? Was that the Atari? Um, so that was the 2600. The 5200 was more like um, it was like a rectangle with a joystick up on the top and the okay. button on the bottom. Oh, that's odd. And, and it was kind of like a weird swivelly kind of thing. And it was, it was notorious for breaking. So if you find them nowadays, it, they're probably worth some money. Swivelly. Uh, like I said earlier, Mike also mentioned his enjoyment of the PlayStation Vita's 
joystick yeah. or thumbstick, which we just mm-hmm. played around with. Yeah. And I agree, I do like it. Though I will say, I wasn't big on it for fighters. Oh, you know, but what? I, normal usage is great. No, no, this is for controllers. Um, for joysticks, uh, the Sega Dreamcast fight stick, which I have actually hanging in my um in my office right here. What about the actuator, huh? Um, what about the love for the actuator? Oh, the actuator. Oh, okay. Before we, we do need to move on, but the um I remember having the um the U Force for the NES. That was the U Force. Okay, so it looked like a notebook, and he would open it up, and, and love letters would get sent through time. <laughs> the Counter Reeves would get it and be like, "Dude, I'm in love." <laughs> no, no, with Sandra Bullock. No, so was it Sandra Bullock? Wow, they they did the movie. Yeah, it was Counter Reeves and Sandra Bullock again. <laughs> Another notebook. What the heck? Anyway, so he would open it up, and it had um, these weird infrared sensors. And so if you put your hand in between inside the notebook it would like trigger left trigger right or uh-huh. up and down and, and bu- it was so dumb it was like one of those like you want to talk about so dumb gimmick, gimmicky things you want to talk about something so dumb so we kept talking about the notebook and I don't know why my brain does like you know what the prequel would have been to the notebook was that Trapper Keeper <laughs> Trapper Keeper and I just I don't know why <laughs> I, t- I hate myself Lisa Frank take me home oh wait a minute no 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 we're not talking about the notebook we're talking about the lake house but the notebook has some timey gunk oh, too, I think. No, I was thinking about the lake house oh, yeah. with Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock. <laughs> okay, that's 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 not what this podcast is about. For now, what's your final track? All right, next track on this episode <laughs> comes from the movie The Lake House. I'm getting so submitted <laughs> by a listener. Oh my god, my favorite game slash movie. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, this track is actually going to come from. I do have a final track for the episode in mind, but I'm okay. going to do this one here because I think it would fit. So this was sort of submitted, but not, but it put the thought in my head. And now I'm stuck on it. Do I, I want to go with it. Do I have it? Yeah, you do. Oh, okay. you do. <laughs> this comes from the game Decap Attack on yes. the Sega Genesis, and it was composed by Fumito Tamayama and Hiroto Kano. This is the theme for level four. Welcome back. You're listening to Level 4 from the game Decap Attack on the Sega Genesis, composed by Fumito Tamayama and Hiroto Kano. Mm. So you're probably asking, why the heck did Pernell pick this track if it wasn't submitted by a Patreon listener this well, episode? I knew that I didn't do the same either. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> I, I have enough tracks at least for oh, this okay, element, okay. but I wanted to go with this in this case because, well, two reasons. One, um, it's come up, I want to say at least a month or two ago, and it stuck with me where we were talking about like games with creepy OSTs for some reason. And Rebecca Gruber mentioned hmm. Decap Attack of all the games that get brought up in this context. And I even think about it because while I am very familiar with Decap Attack, the track that I most associate with the game is that energetic one where you're being chased by the gear wall. So, not the gear wall, but like the weird, it's just a bunch of spears and crap on the wall. But anyway, I wanted to revisit it and. This track stuck out to me as one where like, I think it captures the element of what she's saying. It's like a weird horror spook sensation that comes out of it. It okay. emanates from this track. Yeah. And the other reason why I picked it is because I am in a Genesis game sound mood. Love it. Because a game released this week that, believe it or not, was developed and released on the Sega Genesis. I reviewed it, Ooh, too. What's it called? Xeno Crisis. 
It's freaking good. It's a top-down shooter. Think like Smash TV style where you go room to room. Yeah. And you are a Marine fighting aliens. But, again, the, the sound is designed off of like a... I want to say it's designed using Genesis hardware. Do we know who did the music? I don't off the top oh. of my head, but it's something that's easy to find because yeah, I know I've seen Xeno it. It's called Xenocrisis? Yeah, two words, though. And um, Xeno with an X. Um, but the music in it is really good. The gameplay is great. It's, it's, they released it on the, I want to, according to Joe, I think he said it's on the Sega Genesis, the uh, the Neo Geo. Oh, it looks great. Yeah. On the, the Neo Dreamcast. Geo. Dreamcast. <laughs> it released on the Neo Geo Dreamcast uh, okay. Genesis. It was by um, Savage Regime. Ah, that's who it was? Yeah, I forget the, the guy's real name. But he, he beast that's, mode. That's awesome. That's so good. He was on, I want to say he was on um, the the VG Embassy, one of the earlier episodes. Really? Could be thinking. No, I'm thinking of Trevor Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people. It's a lot of great FM synthesis um, uh, composers now. But yeah, that's awesome. That's that's. That, I'm really excited about that. So, like, honestly, I am so geeked up in this get down with the Genesis mood oh, that it. it was like I I get down with these tracks. Yeah, and yeah. I, I I love this this return to not return. It is kind of a return to 16 bit stuff because there's that there was that. Um, Blazing Chrome, uh, baby. Blazing Chrome just came out, and of course, I referenced it. So, spoiler alert: when the end of the ep- when the end of the year episode we do, where we mm-hmm. talk about our favorite game tracks of the year, or games of the year, both of those are likely going to come up that's, because that's they yeah. surprise the living tar out of me, and they're both gems: so Zeno good. Crisis and Blazing Chrome. Yeah, every time we yeah, have we played? We haven't played any Zeno Crisis music, right? Well, it's hard to find right now. The game because the only the game only just came out. And he only released some preview tracks. But okay, music is um, going to start popping. Down yeah, the no, long. he's his san- on his SoundCloud. There's some music released. And and he might he might have just put it out there. Oh yeah, and there's a vinyl uh, release too. So that's good. That 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 means that. Hey, Pilar just showed up in the in the soon chat. There'll be some stuff on Bandcamp. Hello. Anyway, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, my last track is going to be. From the game, you know what? The game. The I don't game. want to play the game. No, I'm not I don't like that game. game. Yeah. So we are. Going, I'm changing it up for now. My last track comes from the dude, and this is the dogs ending credits from Silent Hill 2. Oh God! For the PlayStation 2. Oh God! Composed man. by Akira Yamaoka. God Jesus! It just was the dogs. The, just was, start the track. It was the dogs the whole time. Just start, just start the track. It was the dogs. Start the track. <laughs> themed episode i'm gonna pick the least horror based track i can find <laughs> pernell is from silent hill it's a scary game <laughs> <laughs> the dog all along flicking some levers this is the the ending the dog's ending from silent hill 2 um one of the special endings you can get where if you do things just right and you end the game you discover that it wasn't monsters it wasn't witches <laughs> jesus it was, it was the dog. It was the dogs the whole time. He's just in a control room in the, in the Riverside Hotel flicking switches. Oh, it's the best. Okay, so um, we can listen to this for the next you know, 30 minutes or so. Christ. All no. right, so we put some questions out to the chat room. So, uh, general question we threw out was, uh, what would you say is your go-to horror game? But in the event that horror isn't your thing, like basically the Rob end of the spectrum, right. what is your go-to <laughs> relaxation game instead? <laughs> And we got a lot more relaxation submissions than spooky ones, right. which is interesting, but I can understand it too. So listener Mike Myers said his feel too good game is Yakuza, the Yakuza franchise. As okay. A whole. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are I heard those are like really just, just fun. They right? are very yeah. fun games. You can you can get serious, you can just get real dopey and ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um 
We've got another listener here that said that their go-to game, that would be Stephen Miller, said his go-to game are, are Hearthstone and Vintage Cube and Magic the Gathering, which I'm going to look into because I've never heard of that latter one. A Vintage Cube? i never heard yeah. of. Yeah, but I've never, I'm not big on Magic the Gathering, not because of a lack of interest, but because I just, the thought of like the falling into the CCG collect all the, the cards yeah. hole kills me, yeah, yeah. which is also why I'm good with getting Yu-Gi-Oh!, because I can get one cart at a time, and it's got like now it contains three thousand cards. It's like, all right, good. I don't have to keep up. Mm. Everything's in here. Do you have any other uh, responses? Let me see. I am going down the line because there's a lot of them. So, whoa, dynamite, Hetty. I wish that was someone's suggestion. Yeah, take your time. I can listen to this all day long. <laughs> no, I gotta hurry up because I don't want to listen to this all day long. <laughs> uh, Laz Rican says he went with the scary end of the spectrum. He mm-hmm. goes, Eternal Darkness and Resident Evil Two Remake are by far the scariest games ever. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man. You need to try. Well, I'm not going to say these games aren't scary, have you played but you need to try Outlast. At I, I have trouble feeling the fear of that game. <laughs> I just don't feel it. No, Outlast. Yeah, you said Outlast is pretty good. Yeah, I would pretty say scary. at least the first half of that game mm. is scary. Once you get used to the style of game, you start to plan stuff out, and it's not so scary so much as just like a strategy. Okay. But early yeah. on, that <laughs> game was terrifying for me. It it made me feel very very anxious. Um. Let me see here. We have Bob Pompilar goes, her go-to visual is the visual novel, The Letter, one of the few games made here Mm. in the Philippines. Cool. And if I want a chill game, I would go for Cave Story. Excellent pick there. Yeah. Cave Story is glorious. That's a game that you can just pick up and just start playing. It's a very action-oriented, but it has a lot of cute characters. It's very colorful. I like that. Yes. I I mean, I I oh. have gone back and replayed that game. I was I terrible it. at it, and I got stuck. I should go back, but you should. What are you gonna do? I mean, you, like, no, no, no. You just answered it. What, what do you What do you do? You go back. No, I'm done. No, I, I, no, it's over. No, it isn't. It's gone. You you go back and play that game. The it is so good. Something. No, I'll <laughs> shoot. You're gonna play that game. Do we have any more, or should we go on to? We should go on. All right. So I'm gonna turn the barks down, and we're gonna get into the part of the show that we call the bonus round. Bup, 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 bonus round. Bup, 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 bup. <laughs> oh, crap. I did have one more. Yes. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> well, I, I want to name this because I want to be that jerk. Okay. So we did, have, we did have one more. Um, let me see. Chris Murray has favorite feel-good calm-down game would be A Link Between Worlds. He said he's played through it approximately 20 times. Wow. That's Beast move. Yeah, wow. So he so like it, that is really like going back to a to um like a safe place, you know? Like it's really something familiar, you know? Mm-hmm. I like that. It's a good one, man. I, I do like the game. At mm-hmm. first I hated it, but I came around. Mm-hmm. And then I want I think the last recon submitted these for this question, but he mentions Blade Bleach Soul Resurrection and No More Heroes Paradise. Hmm. For his PS3 as his I'm assuming those would be chill games. And No More Heroes? Yeah, man. That game can get really weird and ridiculous. That's true. Anyway, it's not time for the bonus round. I'll go back. <laughs> bonus round. <laughs> hey, the bonus round's the part of the show where we play covers and remixes based on our theme. And wait a minute. We get, that, get that dog out of here. Get him out. <laughs> He's over. He's over. He's over. That's uh, covers and remixes on our theme. And um, our theme this week, well, it's Halloween, so we're going to be playing some Halloween kind of oriented. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I'm going to kill this animal. <laughs> I'm going to kill it. All right. So on our bonus round, we are going to pick some Halloween themed covers and arrangements. Pranel, what's your first track? Don't you do it. Leave that damn dog off. Leave him off. This. <laughs> you keep your like waiting for me to do it. This track is <laughs> from submitted by a listener to keep your fingers away from it. The dude. Uh, this is from the band The Megas, which we're oh, fans of here in the in the studio. Fantastic. This is a great pick. And the track title is called Bloody Tears. I believe it's from their the Belmonts EP album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like the, they call it like the Belmonts mixtape uh-huh. when he was on the show. It's really cool. All right. <laughs> it sounds like a Christmas jingle too. That's the.
fighting from this battle must be won. I seriously, you, we were both getting like a weird, you know what, I'm not, we're not saying he sounded like him, but we were trying to seriously pull out like Stone Temple Pilots. Like, <laughs> These bloody tears. Oh, oh, that oh was, God. Oh, that was good. Oh, it really so was. Good. And it's amazing more so because when he, when I was listening to the tracks he submitted, I didn't like this at first. I was like, eh, I'm oh, really? not going to feel this. I'm not going to enjoy this. And then I listened to it five times. And I was like, well, clearly I like something about it because I haven't stopped. So he did submit a testimonial. Okay. The dude goes, mm. the dude abides with the Megas. Honestly, they're probably what got me hooked more into VGM than anything else. I've always loved the music and games, but just the flawless way they mix the untold story of classic Mega Man with the NES masterpieces of an OST. It hooked me in. Mm. From the Megas, I discovered nerdcore hip-hop, and eventually that led me to your awesome podcast. I chose oh, Bloody Tears nice. mostly due to the theme. When I think spooky tunes, my mind immediately goes <clears> towards <throat> Castlevania. Mm. And OST, I'm sure, has been done to death on your show. We did two episodes specifically <laughs> focused on it. So I chose to show an awesome song telling the story of another NES master class. Hope you enjoy it. Oh, and man. if you're down with nerdcore hip-hop, I'm not sure if he's still throwing stuff out there, but look into YT Cracker. That was like the first guy that I heard do it that made me go, this is really freaking awesome. Well, he's probably thinking of the nerdcore hip-hop crossover of the Megas with Mega Ran and ah. that Splash Woman song. That was so good. It was. Which, here we go, my bonus round track. Are you serious? It is, better not be. Yeah, it's Mega Ran um, from uh, his Symphony of the Night album, which I forget what it was called, but this is called, this is a Dance of the Pales slash No Sleep, and it's Mega Ran featuring uh, Samus the Rapper and the Ranger. No Surrender. From Symphony of the Night. (laughs) 
Right when the story begins, I was about 9 to 10 Nothing really on my mind, except playing with my friends I was just minding my business, think I was doing some dishes All of my boys were out, she said I could go when I finished I turned the radio on, and they were playing a song It was called Treat Em Right, became my favorite song Scrubbing my platters and cups, I was like, that is what's up Boom of his voice and the message within, and he didn't cuss Positive rap with a message, and it was dope and a blessing I cranked it up in my box, and my mom stopped for a second This is where it all began, me and hip hop fell in love I didn't know what it was but the whole house was a buzz Showed it to all of the peeps Bumped it all day in the streets This is before a CD So we had to rewind and repeat This is before I was spitting That's when I made a decision That I was straight from the rescue Cause it was okay to be different Wake up, create Make appointments, be late Eat now, no replies Lunchtime, open wide Every day, no surprise Next day, early rise Seems ironic, don't it? Right at the very same moment. And the yes was all the rage, and you were the best if you owned it. I wasn't one of the richest, so when it dropped, I ain't get it. Tried to show some commitment, but my mom didn't get it. I was a hard headed kid, had to be constantly warned. Mama said, No TV, I got whipped if it was warm. Had to have a nest, I sit with my back erect. If I could pass the test, she'd get me an action set. Then I'd be up on the crew, cause it was packaged with two games better than one. Duck Hunter and Mario won. After a couple of days, we were conducting some trades. Came up on Mega Man 2. From that day everything changed Still had the same boombox Used to record your rock Now I record the music to the games I got That's how the story began Most people don't even know Funny how the thing you seek Is often under your nose Wake up, create Make appointments, be late Email, no replies Lunchtime, open wide Every day, no surprise Next day, early rise Repeat no sleep, no sleep, no sleep. I used to teach in the public schools and I didn't love it. Students were some of the toughest, neighborhoods some of the roughest. One thing I never forgot when I got back to the block, how fortunate that I was, though we did not have a lot. Nothing like teaching a kid, seeing a look on his face when he begins to progress. All of the stuff that they take, used to hate it a lot. They touched the patience a lot, staring all day at my watch, wishing it was three o'clock. Then when they something clicked, if I was to win at this, I had to give the same effort that I was giving my spits. I came out early to work, I was the last to leave. I know what children need, somebody they can believe. When I go back today, yeah, that's okay. You made me a better man, that's all I had to say. There was a lesson to learn in every failure I've had. You can enjoy the good unless you've been through the bad. Wake up, create, make appointments, be late. Eat now, no replies. Lunchtime, open wide, every day. No surprise, next day, early rise, repeat, no sleep, no sleep, no sleep. It is good to love many things, for therein lies the true strength. And whosoever loves much performs much, and can accomplish much. And what's done in love is always well done. Was no Sleep, Dance of the Pales from Symphony of the Night, performed by Mega Ram. I, I love that tune because he just goes, he goes really um, internal about why he wanted to pursue doing his form of rapping. Like, like, not just rapping, but like rhyming about, you know, the stuff he loves, like old school games and rhyming over on top of old school games. Um, mm-hmm. So I like that. A lot. And also that track is a waltz, man. That was a three four rhythm that he was rapping on top of. You don't you don't hear that very very often. Everything's always like a four on the floor. Yeah, I've always liked that track in mm-hmm. Symphony of the Night in and of itself. So yeah, it's it was cool really to good. see it thrown into this song and yeah. then have that drum step over it. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds really like the piano section is really nice. I like that a lot. So, Honestly, Mega Ran is just, just like the This wasn't this was an all star all star bonus round, I think. Mm-hmm. Love it. Well, for more information on the bonus round part of our show, go to rhythmandpixels.com and we'll have links to the SoundClouds and Bandcamps everywhere everywhere where you can buy the music and support the artists. Thanks for listening to episode 20-7 of Rhythm and Pixels. Our uh, our live streamed episode of uh, listener submitted songs. 
and Halloween themed tracks spooky and spooky. Castlevania <laughs> and Castlevania <laughs> and Castlevania tracks. So this probably won't stick around too long because it's just it does its job so friggin' well. But this was submitted by listener Last Reekin, and this is the theme to Lavender Town from the original Pokemon Red and Blue games. But this is the Fire Red Leaf Green version of it. So he states, and I agree with. The fact that he feels as though this is a ridiculous, this is a surprisingly creepy track for such a game being Pokemon. And, again, I agree with him. It doesn't hurt that, honestly, when you really get down to the nitty gritty, there are some disturbing and creepy stuff involved with the Pokemon universe anyway. Especially, like, read like, their Pokemon descriptions. There's Pokemon that eat children's souls, Oof. that capture their parents and put them to slave labor. Oh, there's some crazy stuff. There is some stuff. I think there's, like, one Pokemon where... It is. It's, comp- it's actually the soul of like lost and deceased babies. Wow. Like it is actually that's what the Pokemon is, and yet you see their imageries and you're like, wow, look how adorable that is. Like, no, that thing is messed up. Squirtle? Oh, yeah, Squirtle! <laughs> <laughs> the ghost Pokemon types. Oh, okay. Typically, the ghosts that have all the messed up descriptions. <laughs> uh, well, um, so we have uh, next week is going to be maybe our 200th episode of the show. And then later on in the month of November, we'll have our fourth podcast anniversary. So I'm putting it out there to our listeners, anybody. Um, if you have any favorite memories of the show, I'm thinking of doing like a kind of a weird super cut of some of our favorite little jokes and um, memories that we've done on the show. And so, it would be interesting because mm-hmm. I, my memory is atrocious. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if there, if you, I forgot it all already. So if you think back and be like, hey, on that episode, there was like that one thing where you did this thing. I'll, I'll find it. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so if you have any memories, I, w- I would love, love to hear about it. But um, but as usual, um, if you would like to get in contact with us and say hi, or if you have any track suggestions or topic suggestions, please send us an email. Rhythmandpixels at hotmail.com. And if you would like to find more information about our show, and um, links to all the other stuff that we're doing, like the SML podcast, um, Hey Poor Player, and uh, links to the all past, of, all of the, the links to the past, links, <laughs> all the Zelda episodes, no access to all of our old episodes and all the track listing. You can go to our website, rhythmandpixels.com. Um, you can say hi to us on all of the uh, Facebook and Instagrams and the Twitters, and it's it's rhythm and pixels, all one word. Uh, usually find us on youtube youtube.com slash rhythm and pixels all of our episodes get uploaded there and we also have a 24 7 radio stream of 8-bit and 16-bit classics and if you'd like to support the show you know just tell people about it it doesn't matter you know, tell and trust when i say you're at the gas station you're getting just, yes tell people like it's yeah, your boss so talk to your boss about it like if you're like hey look i got i really need to talk to you um and set up a meeting and sit down dr- dress up wear a tie and then go in the meeting and say listen there's this podcast it's just really good just craft a tableau presentation or a microsoft power mm-hmm. bi presentation yes. on the on the virtues a powerpoint rhythm and pixels PowerPoint makes me get, feel good yeah and here's the ways in which it does so. and if your boss says i don't know what a podcast is quit your job don't quit your job <laughs> we are not negative influences we are positive influences oh, yeah, the puppy <laughs> but seriously tell your friends Tell anyone who will listen just by virtue of sharing. That's honestly an awesome thing to do. On it, it just feels good to share good things. And quite frankly, I mm. hit the point where I share the show as well. I share a number of shows um, <laughs> because it's become a very big part of our lives. I think. Yeah. So it's a good thing. Yeah, it's just, just a good thing. Something you just keep doing. But and um, Rob is now cuddling this puppy. Mm. Okay, and if you would like to uh, support the show in other ways, you can go to patreon.com slash rhythm and pixels. Um, you get access to our monthly live streams uh, um, that we, we record the show live, just like this one. And we also like to thank all of our patrons at the end of every episode. <laughs> he is Excuse struggling me. here. This dog just uh, wants to be loved. Yeah, he does. Or she does. Um, so we'd like to thank uh, that Nick Walker, Mike Myers, Phantom Jest, Steve Miller, The Autistic Gamer 89, Cameron Worma, Christopher Shenstrom, <laughs> a Bobby Arson of One Up Funk, uh, Wicked Sephiroth, OK Impala, Carlito of the Heroes 3 podcast. Um, he just did an episode with Ed on the VG Embassy. Mm-hmm. I'd like to thank uh, Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound Version podcast. We've had him on the show recently, and that was that's like I, I love it when he's on the show. That's like one of my favorite ones. I agree. 
uh, Brian Pitt, Chris Murray, Ed Wilson from the VG Embassy, Alexander Proudfoot, Davy Cakes, The Dude, The Last Recon, Bedroth, Jupiter Jazz, Solus Sanctuary. It's good to see you. Uh, Damian Beckles, Joe Vassalo, Chris Steenerson, Alex, The Messenger, Messenger, and David Smith. Thank you all very much for your continued support of the podcast. As always appreciate you guys are the best. And I will say, so so I earlier mentioned the whole scenario regarding the Patreon suggest submissions for the pre for the following months. So just to reiterate, because I think a few people popped in later um to the chat. So due to the challenge that some folks had with submitting themed tracks. We're not going to get rid of that because it was awesome getting the theme tracks we did get, but we're going to take themes and regulars with themes taking precedence because that's the point of a theme. So for next month, unless you guys don't think this is a good topic, the thought I had in mind was tracks, games, or composers that you are thankful for. Hmm. So oh, I like that. Just like it might say, for example, I know a number of our listeners have a love for Yuzo Koshiro. That would be a prime example. Of like, yo, I chose this track from Streets of Rage 2 mm-hmm. because this is the standout track from Yuzo Koshiro for me. And then just say some razzmatazz about what you like about the guy oh, or like just yeah. his stuff. Totally. You know, so. That's a great theme. Yeah. I like that a lot. Now, the question is. Will you? <laughs> like, there's like the Simpsons thing where the guy's pointing at the camera. Will or you like you, it? Would you? Will you <laughs> like it? So take a crack at yeah, it. Like Submit that. some tunes and some testimonials. It'll be awesome to have some gab about mm-hmm. it. Yeah, good idea. I like that one. Well, anyway, thanks for listening to the show, Rhythm and Pixels. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. Have a safe week. We'll see you next time. And remember, life has been can be pretty tough. Um, I've actually had a number of scenarios in the last few weeks, even where I've had people come to me and express some pretty heavy life scenarios that took place in their lives, like really heavy stuff. Um, scenarios where to be quite frank, if those things played out in their entirety, I would be very, very sad. That goes for both my friends that I know in person and my friends that I'm, that are listening to the show right now be blunt sorrow should not be the end all be all it doesn't have to be just make efforts make attempts to feel better if you can't reach out try reaching out to friends if you don't have friends you have us reach out to us um just don't give up keep trying and even small things can lead to big results i mean i'll flat out just state a fact obviously here i've been losing a lot of weight unexpected and i started from not caring to suddenly caring and boom small efforts are yielding results and it's actually made me happier in that regard too it does freaking work you can do more and you can do and feel better you just have to keep trying because here's the thing about giving up once you stop trying that's it that's all but as long as you keep trying there's always another chance never stop Never stop moving. Never stop trying. Keep going. I'll stop rambling. (laughs) That's my deal. Have a good night.